Welcome, 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 welcome to this, our second edition of In The Soup, a reflection program that happens every two weeks produced by Voret. We talk about the subject matter that is keeping us up at night. I am your host for the evening. My name is Kopano Maruja. I am a performance artist, writer, culture worker. I'm currently working at Voret as a programmer and dramaturg. And joining me today are our luminous guests, Tulile Kametze and Kudus Onikeko. Tuli is a cultural worker from Johannesburg, South Africa, and Kudus is a movement artist based in Lagos, Nigeria. And tonight we will be speaking about art as education, art as social change, looking at how in the past few months we've witnessed how the arts has, uh, as a global field and sector, been financially disregarded by most governments. And yet art has been one of the fields providing information, care, entertainment, solace, and the tools for liberation throughout these unprecedented and strange times. We want to ask the questions, in what ways, big and small, does art function as an educational medium? In what ways can that education drive social change? How can we collectively come to understand art as a series of social practices and not only a process that produces a consumable product? Now, it would not be in the soup without the actual soup. Uh, for every edition of In The Soup, we are collaborating with an artist to tailor make a soup that is inspired uh, by the subject matter that we'll be going over in the session. And for the month of July, our collaborating artist is none other than the fantastic Fiona Hallinan. Hi, Fiona. I want to invite you to introduce yourself, um, who you are, what it is that you do, your practice, and then to guide us through the soup that you have prepared for us tonight. Great. Hi, Capano. Thank you so much. Um, and hi, Tuli and Kudus. It's really, really such an honor to meet you both. Um, so as Capano said, my name is Fiona Hallinan, and I'm really happy to be here and making these recipes of soup for In the Soup in July. Um, so my background is I'm an artist and a researcher, and I'm currently working on a PhD that looks at the process of setting up a new concept that is called ultimology and it examines that which is dead or dying. So in order to do this, I conduct interviews with practitioners across different fields and disciplines. And I ask them what in their experience or in their close field of vision is dying out. And then I employ embodied practices, including making food to expand the sort of research that I gather into activities and events. Um, and alongside this, I organize, I organize a reading group that explores different conceptions, constructions, and approaches to questions of death, dying, and the dead. So um, today I wanted to make a recipe that sort of reflected on some of the themes of education and social change and artistic practice. And I hope some of you had a chance to make the soup recipe that we circulated. Um, if you have, or even if you haven't, I just wanted to start the conversation, hey, Capano, yes, <laughs> by taking a little moment um, where we could kind of um, metaphorically gather around a table, I suppose. So if you have your bowl in front of you, I'm going to put mine here and turn this up like this. So the soup for this uh, session was a garlic and shiitake broth with lots of garlic and leek and celery to help your microbiota to thrive. Um, so just to begin, I thought it would be nice that we take a moment just to pause and take a breath. So I'd invite you to join me just to take two breaths and in each one to breathe in to a count of six and then to breathe out to a count of six. So when I was making this recipe and thinking about the theme of the conversation of education and social change, I was really conscious of this moment when the physical buildings of education in a lot of countries are, are closed and inaccessible. Um, and I thought as well about different austerity situations in different states that have been undermining these places for the last few years before coronavirus. So for example, 
Um, recently in the UK, I read that the government announced they were going to pull back a program that gave children one free piece of fruit a day. And I've been thinking about this sort of um, link between these things, this removal of common resources that affect children and students and learners, and how taking away time in shared spaces to learn and resources to learn really exaggerates existing inequalities and really destabilizes people, especially people who don't have consistent or safe or private spaces to learn outside of school. So I wanted to make a recipe that's kind of stabilizing and about restoring balance. And in the recipe that I sent around, I described this soup as being a close match to seawater. So it's something salty and restorative and made from really little, but matches as closely as possible the minerals that you have inside you anyway. So it's a mushroom and seaweed stock and the intention of it is to be soothing and gentle and easy to adapt according to what you have. Um, it's a soup to nourish your insides and as much as we can to mimic the balance of minerals you need to survive. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you again, Kapano and Tuli and Kudus. And I'm really excited to experience the conversation today. And I hope those of you who have a actual real physical soup in front of you enjoy it too. Thank you so much, Fiona. <laughs> the soup, I can confirm, is fantastic. Oh, I was good. reading in the recipe, though, that I needed 25 <laughs> garlic cloves. Did I read that right? Because yes. I was sure that I wasn't reading it right. <laughs> Five. It's really okay. immune boosting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I skimped out a little bit. I, I went for, I think, like six. <laughs> It's also, you kind of have to go into the process of chopping 25 garlic cloves, maybe enlist some help. <laughs> right, and I was one man, so I was just like, mm -hmm, maybe not today. Yes, it's a bit <laughs> more uh, restriction if you're not going to any social gatherings. It's like, enjoy all this that. This is stuff. really true. Like, if you've got nowhere else to go, you can definitely chop 25 garlic cloves. So <laughs> you'll find the recipe for this soup on the site of Uretz um, at the event for In the Soup number two, Art as uh, Education and Art as Social Change. Thank you so much, Fiona, for this Thank lovely, you. lovely soup and for the considerations that you shared with us. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right, hey, to our main contenders. <laughs> Today we're speaking with Tulele Kamedze and Kudus Onikeko about art as education and art as social change. And before we get into the content um, of this discussion, I'd like to invite you, Tulele, to give us uh, an, a more in-depth introduction of yourself than I gave, it was just one line. And if you could just tell us who you are, what it is that you do, where in the world you are, and how you're doing in relation to the current circumstances of COVID and lockdown uh, where you are. Hi, um, Kopano and Kudus and Fiona and everyone who I can see plus um, invisible viewers. I just got a text from my friend Brett um, of me taking a sip of tea. <laughs> it's kind of weird um, <laughs> and surreal, but I'm aware there's an audience. Um, so thanks for listening. Um, my name is Tulile Esther Gamete. Um, I am a bunch of things in between a bunch of other things, but um, Primarily for the past five years or so, um, my most consistent work is writing about art. Um, but I started making drawings again recently. Um, I'm a curator and I'm very invested in pedagogy and social life, I guess. Um, so yeah, right now, um, I have no social life. I'm in Johannesburg, um, in my flat on my own, um, which in relation to what's going on in South Africa is an extremely privileged space to be. Um, I guess at the moment, it's a bit chaotic. Um, we did, or the, the government did what it could to slow down and prepare 
uh, well it could, but now the economy is pretty much back wide open and the cases are going up very quickly, um, especially because a lot of people don't have the option of socially distancing um, because of commuting, because of dense living spaces, because of poverty in South Africa. Um, so yeah, it's a bit intense and strange to be both to know what's going on and to be somewhat part of it, but also to be so far away from people. So I mostly only see my parents. Um, but yeah, that's how things are at the moment. And um, if anything, it's really nice to, to do this today. Um, break in the routine. So yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you so much for making the time to be here with us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, before I give the word over to, to Kudus to introduce himself, I do want to backtrack a little bit and do a little bit of housekeeping for our audience. So for the folks that are in the actual webinar, the participants that we have here in Zoom, I just want to bring your attention to the chat function. And that's where we're going to be sharing all the information that is kind of applicable to everyone. So links that maybe are going to be spoken about and or if there are some technical difficulties, audio, video, please feel free to send us a message over there or to send it message directly to Info Voret, who is one of the uh, panelists today, um, who's doing the technical and back end to let them know, let myself know that there are some technical difficulties on your end. And we also have a Q&A function. So if you direct your attention to the bottom of your Zoom webinar, you'll see that there is a Q&A uh, icon that you can click on. And if you have a question for uh, directly to the panelists about any of the subject matter that we're speaking about, I would suggest that you send it there and that, so that it doesn't get uh, lost in the chat function where there's a lot of different kind of information that's being shared. So if you have a direct question for the panelists, please do send it over to the Q&A section and I'll be monitoring that to make sure that those questions do get asked. And if you're watching this on Facebook, please feel free to ask your questions or submit your questions into the Facebook comment section of this video, and they will be transported by uh, the people that are working on the technical back end, and they will transport it over here to Zoom so we can ask those questions to our panelists. And with that, I would like to give the word over to Kurus Onigeko. Can you please tell us a little bit about who you are, what it is that you do, where in the world you are, and how you're doing um, personally and also in relation to the context of COVID in your country? Um, so my name is Kudus Onigeko. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are watching. I, I imagine myself as a movement artist. Uh, performance artist, performing artist as well. And I, um, uh, in the last couple of years, my work has geared so much towards uh, community organizing as well, uh, curating, um, uh, um, organizing performance installations. And um, of course, uh, a lot of teaching and, um, and mentoring and, um, and um, presently, actually, we, we've been working on a new creation before the lockdown started. So we kind of like uh, put that in a, on a hold. And um, just last week, Monday, we resumed back um, to, to the studio with about um, uh, 10 dancers and one musician. And everybody is presently um, camping in my apartment. Uh, so that we can be safe <laughs> because having about 15 people going back and forth every day uh, through local local transportation is a kind of risky. Uh, so it was a risk we weren't willing to take. So we decided to put everybody in, in a camp situation. And so, and my house is very close to the studio. So we just get two cars and move everybody and come back. So actually that was one of the reasons why I was late and it was because I was just coming from the studio. Um, it was also good to be back to the studio, to, back to the creative process. I think I missed that a lot uh, during the lockdown. Uh, presently, really, Lagos is, is opening up a bit more. Um, people are going out, just that everybody's wearing the mask and using hand sanitizers and just trying to, to keep the uh, security measures. But in all, really, uh, things are really picking up back again in, in Nigeria. 
Oh, right, eh? Thank you for sharing that with us. I think it's really strange to be in this moment where there's been such intense kind of like physical distance over such a protracted period and then all of a sudden this ability to be together and trying to like navigate how one does that in the most responsible way while also being a practitioner is quite a is quite something to to navigate and i'm not sure about the 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 communication um with the governments in Nigeria and South Africa, but I know here in Belgium, it can be very confusing, um, the messages that are being sent to different sectors about how they can do things or how they cannot do things, and also trying to use one's own discretion um, and take into account one's own access needs. It's a lot to consider in this moment. So I feel like we're all yeah in, in the soup a little bit. Um, so thank you for sharing what the context is in, in, in Lagos. Um, I wanted to jump in to the art as education uh, question or component. And I wanted to direct my question, my first question at uh, Tuli. Um, in an interview or rather an article for Bubblegum Club, they, they stated that you're someone that is interested in the radical potential of education as a central project of liberation, as well as decolonization as art practice. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit towards how you imagine or how you envision education, what, what that looks like and what that means for you. Because I, I know we have our assumptions about what education is, that it happens in institutions, um, et cetera. But I wonder for you, how do you see that? How do you define that? And the, um, the centrality of it, the project of liberation, how you see those two connections working? Um, yeah, so I guess, um, my interest in um, education, like as a, as a, well, my interest in education started, I suppose, in 2015 um, in Cape Town with being part of Roads Must Fall. Um, I'm not going to get into what that space was, except for a kind of decolonial student movement. Um, but for me, I came into that space following a fine art undergraduate degree and, um, being within that, um, occupation space as it was, um, and hanging out with people from different departments, um, and meeting, all the revolutionaries of the UCT undergraduate squad um, was a pretty intense um, moment for me in the sense that it caused me to seriously question what I had been learning for the past life um, on on a, in a different kind of way than I had before. And I think for me, that kind of political education was a bit, a bit late, but it all happened at once. Um, and I guess I became interested in how it is that um, what's essentially an illegal occupation becomes the space in which I feel at home in a way that I haven't before in the university space. And also the, the learning that's happening is so intense and so embodied and so, um, and involving everything about who I am. Um, so it was like a really strange uh, awakening to what it, what it can feel like to be learning and to the fact that uh, the learning, the really valuable learning spaces are, are usually the ones that are less allowed um, and are more impossible um, and uh, are not respectable and not legitimate. So for me, that kind of started me thinking about what, what's happening um, in, in places that say they are about learning and where else is some other interesting stuff happening. So 
Yeah. That would be my, my answer there. Um, <laughs> I try and steer, steer more clear away from words like liberation these days. Um, I don't know why, but like, um, I'm interested in um, learning that opens things up and opens up different possibilities than might have been in the space before. Um, so in that sense, I guess, like education as liberation and all of these fancy things that, <laughs> that I was saying about myself at some stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most deaf. And I think a, a, a big conundrum that we can often find ourselves in, in using terms like liberation, like decolonization, all the shins, uh, is that there are a lot of ideas that are already attached to them. Um, and what is meant in our specific kind of situation or from our specific um, vantage point doesn't necessarily come across when a word has so many assumptions that are attached to it. So I definitely resonate with the, um, the dubiousness um, and the, the, the precarity of particular language and trying to open up and find different possibilities and even more specific language for what it is that we mean and what it is that things like liberation and decolonization, decolonization look like to us in practice. Um, so that's something that I definitely resonate with. And kind of going on the, um, this idea of educational work that happens on the fringes or in the in-betweens, Kudus, there's a kind of mini documentary on your website looking at you and your practice. And you, you say this really beautiful thing about how you as a, as a dance uh, teacher and or when you're in a facilitation role for other dancers or other movers, um, that you cannot teach one how to dance, um, but that you can bring them to consciousness. And I, I found that that, that parallel, um, what, what seems like maybe a, um, a parallel or a kind of a binary between the, the, the dancing body and the conscious mind in this kind of like traditional Cartesian dualism um, that we inherited from the West, um, how you kind of just um, distort that or disintegrate that somewhat and, and in a very kind of humble way, admit that there's nothing that one can transfer to another person, but one can definitely create the context for something to happen. And I wonder for you and in your practice, how do you connect those things of the embodied body raising consciousness or as an access point to consciousness? Where's um, consciousness itself? <laughs> where's, <laughs> where's consciousness itself? I feel like um, consciousness, it's something that uh, that we derive from um, from trusting in our in our in our capacity, in our sensations, you know, in our senses, in you know, in, in the capacity of our senses to actually produce accurate computation intelligence, and the capacity to heal and to resolve past understanding, even future misunderstandings, and. For me, I feel like the whole work of consciousness is the whole work of total understanding and realignment of the body, the mind, and the spirit to be to be in harmony again. And 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 for us, especially those of us who are from the continent, um, one of the one of the biggest process of of disruption of that of that wholeness and that alignment between the the mind, the body, and the spirit. Is colonialism. That is that that process where there is a huge separation between our spirit, our spiritual understanding, our spiritual intuition, our spiritual intelligence, and the capacity of our body to do all the amazing things that people do with their body on the continent and outside of the continent in the diaspora. Then the the, the total disconnection between those and education and the educational structure, the educational system within which we, we want to then build the new humans who are going to then build a kind of a enviable future. So I, I always say when I first started working with young people, especially here, I realized that even what I thought was supposed to be like a given, which is the spirit, was actually also being colonized by, the, by religion. Uh, and so I, I said, oh my God, I even thought 
it was lesser than this, but the problem is even more. That is to say, I realized that the body in a very, in a very um, unknowing way, like very, very um, innocent way, the body has kind of like became the only part of our consciousness that actually kept the memories for us almost intact. Because unlike the other two, actually, when you toy the body, when you exercise the body, when you punish the body, actually the body becomes stronger. It's a kind of a, fix, a fitness exercise for the body when you actually make it go through um, uh, strenuous events. Um, so the body has a way of, of keeping for us layers and layers and layers of memories and intelligence that is only waiting for our conscious minds to come to it. So there are three levels of consciousness in my, in my own understanding. Um, that's which you know that you know, that I know that we are on Zoom right now. I know how to operate Zoom. You know, I know that one. Um, that's which you know that you don't know. I know I cannot speak Chinese. I know I cannot speak Arabic. I know I don't, I've never been to, I don't know what, I've never been to your home. So I don't know this one. But the third level of consciousness is what I'm excited about. is the one that you don't know that you know. And, and that's where art becomes exciting. That's where dance becomes interesting because that's where you have a whole myriads and <laughs> a whole universe and multiverse of, of intelligence waiting for you to be conscious of it. It's always there. When somebody says something that resonates with you, it's not because somebody said that thing, that's why it resonates. It resonates with you because it's actually there within the layers of your skin or your veins that something unearths it. And you say, oh, wow, that's dope. It's not dope because of what the person said. <laughs> it's dope because that thing that is said met with something that is inside of you that unearths it. And it kind of like a spark, it creates a spark. And eventually you say, wow, I get it. That's an amazing idea. So for me, that's the way I see dance. Using dance as a way to... to to help the society to remember the layers and layers of things that they might have forgotten through complication with religion, with schooling. Schooling is one of the greatest uh, killers of, of, of our minds on the continent because most of the curriculum we all work with, they're still colonial, extremely Western in their conception, in the ways at which it was thought about and the functionality of education itself as being extremely about capitalism and upholding the the, 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 the the good works of capitalism, good work in quotes, right? Mm. Thank you so much for that. That was such a intricate, intricate <laughs> answer. And I really love how you you touch on the, the body as this um, site of accumulated aggregated information, especially right now, as we're in this kind of moment where for the past few years with the, the field of epigenetics, intergenerational trauma, inherited memory, mm -hmm. embodiment through the body is mm. becoming more and more of, a, of an expansive field. And earlier today, I was listening to a podcast by um, uh, On Being uh, by Krista Tippett, and she was interviewing Resma Menikem, who's a clinical psychologist mm. in North America who works specifically on the, the embodiment of racism and embody practices mm. to, to undo or to, well, not undo, but to process racism, not only for black people, or as he calls them, people of culture, which I love, <laughs> uh, not only for people of culture, but also for white people who are the, the carriers, but also the uh, victims of their own violence, um, ironically. So it really, that makes me think of that. And I, I really appreciate that, that connection that you, that you make there. And I, I, I wonder, with this kind of like looking at these, this, this kind of idea of um, alternatives to educational forms that we kind of like understand uh, today, and specifically looking at uh, the continent, the African continent, and maybe even more specifically Sub-Saharan Africa and the kind of systems of educational um, movements uh, and technologies that exist there. I, I was wondering, Tuli, if you could speak to um, the work that you were looking at with your thesis, Imp Impossible Paradigms, looking at this tradition of um, Black, Southern, African, cultural and artistic and educational 
exchange and movements of re resistance, uh, specifically the Medu Arts Ensemble. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that thesis of yours and how those things connect. Yes. Um, Kudus, I really enjoyed what you were saying. Made my heart start. It did that thing you were talking about. <laughs> um, so, yes, I mean, I suppose on the whole continent, um, there's very specific histories of um, colonial strategies for containing education and within the arts specifically there were like a whole bunch of different processes made to kind of contain or create the colonized subject um, and the, the first crime I guess usually was the destruction of of cultural objects, of actual manifestations, of evidence of cultural and intellectual life that existed before colonialism. Um, and from that initial crime, various other um, strategies were come up with to, to make sure, um, to make sure that, you know, the colonized people were not too big for their boots. Um, so for instance, in arts education, um, like in arts is often understood by kind of the Western imagination of the marker of what makes a true enlightened human. Um, and so restricting access to arts is kind of the first thing that happens. Um, and then introduction or reintroduction into arts education is always through um, the position of the, the colonizer um, imposing a notion of what the African artist should make. Um, so in Southern Africa, this was largely like um, strategies that um, would be like, how do I explain it? Um, like the untrained African artist. So black artists must not be trained, but they must work from their natural African intuition um, in order to produce and reproduce an image of what it means to be African from the perspective of a colonialist or from the motherland or whatever. So we kind of step into this context of I mean, British rule and then apartheid, um, both forms of colonialism within this long history of having been contained and indoctrinated and contaminated by missionaries, um, by shitty arts education. Um, and I guess um, that's kind of the Medu ensemble formed I can't even remember now, but in the 70s. Um, yeah, they, and they formed kind of out of the um, 70, well, post the 76 uprisings um, and in response to the urgency of the situation and um, with the kind of energy that art should be doing something within this context and in response to and against this long history. Um, so, I mean, since I wrote my thesis, a lot of my views have kind of radically shifted or moved, um, which I think is important. Um, but in the way that I was thinking about the, the thesis is that um, cultural work um, which is often necessarily meets or disrupts the law, is often illegal, um, is a way through which, um, okay, wait, sorry, I'm struggling with, <laughs> I'm struggling with my work, my words here. Um, but I guess to go back to where this comes from, um, as I was talking about in, 
the first time I spoke, uh, which was my interest in Rhodes Must Fall, I was interested in this idea of cultural work um, and the fact that I was seeing something happening in Rhodes Must Fall and I was looking for this um, in history, I guess. And so Medu Ensemble, I was thinking about um, as a history of cultural work, which similarly and on a much larger scale disrupted the parameters of institutions. In this case, it disrupted the border of South Africa by operating just outside of it in Gaurone um, and smuggling stuff in and out um, and being involved as an outsider, but also as an insider in South Africa. Um, and so in one way, Medu was situated outside of South Africa and on the kind of um, borders, I suppose, in a similar way to what roads must fall on a much smaller scale was, was situated kind of on the, on the borders of not quite, um, and as a disruption to the institution of the university. So I was sort of interested in the fact that, that this work, which is more illegal work, political work, um, rupturing work, is, is where the culture is, as opposed to necessarily within um, institutions that claim to house it. So it was always kind of this, this thing of like, okay, yes, we're happening maybe to make images or to create things, but more the idea of cultural work is, is a space of um, imagination in the sense that it allows for something impossible to happen in a space where that thing cannot happen. Um, so for me, that was my interest in in Medu, um, in the fact that they were doing some kind of impossible work. Um, but of course, I have many re-revisions in the sense of, of thinking Medu kind of against the black consciousness movement in South Africa um, and politics of ANC and UDF and all of these complicated things. So in a way, I think I, I took quite an idealistic um, viewpoint, but still that, that central interest remains the same. Mm. I think utopian thinking is definitely encouraged, <laughs> <laughs> even if in its in, in inevitable naivete. I think, yeah, it's really necessary in the work that you do through that thesis and making those linkages between the work of an arts ensemble that is working across colonially constructed borders as a kind of insurgency and as a kind of necessary criminality is something that I think is so important and resonant today where we see the ways in which these uh, borders that we inherited on the continent and that are so firmly um, protected here in Europe and the world over um, recreate or rather reinforce the ways in which certain bodies are policed and certain others aren't and who can move and who cannot move. Um, so these kinds of initiatives and these kinds of examples from history where people have done this kind of work before, people have done this kind of pan-African cross-nation uh, border work um, is such a encouraging fact to, to know and to also then see in the, in the present day, in the more present day, looking at Roads Must Fall and its resonances across the world, not only in South Africa, but then the institution of Roads Must Fall in the, in the United Kingdom, in London, at the University of Oxford, um, just speaks to the necessity to think across and beyond these uh, artificially constructed parameters that we inherited uh, from the colonial Era. So thank you for doing that very important work. <laughs> um, my pleasure. I want to, on that note of, of thinking across borders or thinking about um, collective collaboration outside um, or over borders, I want to ask Kudus, the work that you do with the, the Q Dance Center and uh, the touring that you do, not only in the African continent, but in uh, Europe, predominantly France, um, as a 
a way of thinking about this work of um, working across and under or through borders. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit and the kind of the, 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 the limitations that are maybe present there in trying to work in that way, trying to work across borders, but also the possibilities um, and impossibilities I'm thinking specifically of the, the dance gathering that you, that you recently organized um, uh, as an online festival to connect not just the continent, but the entire world and thinking about blackness. Um, so if you could speak to those things, the Q Dance Center, the dance gathering, and this idea of moving over across and through borders. Um, I, I I think it's um it's important to note to to state at this point that um, I actually became an artist at the borders of different cultures and different countries. I uh, my earlier works were actually done uh, while I was in France. I, I did my schooling in France and I and I stayed there after my schooling to make my my earlier works and and um, there is this form of um. There is this form of um, impossibility to to make myself clear enough uh, while I was existing within the French context and on the French soil, and uh, I think it's one of the things that informed my moving to Nigeria is actually because of that capacity to retain your own um, role as an intermediary, as a as a bridge, but not somebody who actually favor belonging. Um, even though uh, I use Yoruba uh, philosophy and Yoruba understanding, Yoruba tradition as my base, it's actually not because, not entirely because I am Yoruba, but it's because I feel like if we are speaking on the, uh, if we're speaking about, about universal knowledge, um, there, is a, there is a shared domination of the Western ideas on that field which, and I, I have a first-hand experience of the Yoruba geniusness. So I'm like, wait, 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 how come each time you people talk about genius people, you never mention us? <laughs> so for me, I felt like it became um, important for me to be a kind of a mediator. And if uh, knowledge is saturated on the entire surface of the planet, I feel like some of us then become uh, much more responsible for some part of that planet than some are. So if we think about the arts as markets, yes, we will all fall into the trap of thinking that because the West carries the, the marketplace, then we all must play into the game. I actually feel like it's actually a loss on both sides. It's a loss on my own side, losing all of that that I left behind, and it's a loss on their own side uh, not having enough access to that simply because I refuse to bring it. So for me, I, I felt like I, I needed to get myself even more, more and more attuned to, to what, I'm, what is here, what has been, and um, the old sort of uh, misunderstanding or misunderstanding of whatever it was as low art uh, for their own um, sense of um, superiority which I found uh, a shame. Uh, actually, I don't find it, um, <laughs> I, don't find, I, don't, I don't find it hard. I, I don't find it um, painful or I'm not pained about that anymore. I just find it as a shame that you don't know a whole lot about that. So now my role before when I was actually in France, I found that I was actually being more and more activistic in my work. Like, yeah, I need to tell these people, they need to know, they need to know about that, they need to know about this. But now I actually feel like um, my work now deliberately avoids um, preaching or teaching. <laughs> my voice just deliberately avoids it now. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that I, I do a lot of work in the United States and in Europe and of course on the continent. And um, I feel like um, artists in the last maybe, maybe 50 years actually, African artists in the last maybe 50 years, uh, those of us who are traveling artists I'm talking about, the working artists traveling who are always on the move. I think we kind of like spoiled um, Europeans and, um, and Eurocentric artists or audiences by trying too much to explain what we're trying to do. The kind of toiling, the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of, um, of, 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 of 
trouble we don't take our we don't we don't go through when we do our work on on the continent or when we are showing our work at home. So, and I'm saying to myself, I say I think that 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 idea of thinking that I'm going to do all the work of decolonization for myself, which is already a lot of work, then I'm going to come do the same for you. Because you know what? I didn't colonize myself all by myself. <laughs> it, was, it was two ways. <laughs> so if I've been busy for the last 60 years trying to get myself you know, in shape and you are busy not doing the same thing, then all of a sudden I realized I'm like, shit, I, I'm not supposed to be doing this work for you anymore. Actually, you still even don't recognize, you don't appreciate, you don't respect that the fact that I do that for you. So now I got to a point whereby you say, you know what? There's so much kids we need to take care of on the continent and there's a whole lot of future to build. <laughs> so now my work is thinking about, either I'm thinking about the kids or I'm thinking about inventing a future that's never existed. And I'm saying, if I was already colonized and during the process of colonization, my colonizer gained access to the future while I was still dealing with the past. And now that we are all on Facebook and Twitter at the same time and zooming on top of one another, I don't want to lose out in the future again. So my work now is more about thinking about how do we organize today? in order to have a different narrative of the future. In, that, in other words, how do we actually start the work of changing the future from now? So my work really is really more and more interested in that kind of trajectory. So all the thing I'm making around, the name of my, the title of my new work is Reincarnation. Uh, the dance gathering theme for this year was, this is the end, the future is black. And I'm thinking about that in, intentionally now, like, like intentionally working it, and saying, how can we rehearse, rehearse the future to a point where it becomes a tipping point, where it's no longer an idea anymore, but it becomes a fact and it becomes a reality for us. And when I say for us, I'm really, really in that now. I'm not working. I was telling my dancers today, I said, now, actually, I've never done it. I do not make work to honor those I don't respect. I don't make work to talk about dictators. I don't make work to talk about terrorists. I don't make work to talk about racist people. I make work to honor all the people that I love, all the things I love to see, all the people I respect, all the things I wanna see. So when I make work and I use Fela's music, I'm honoring Fela by doing that. When I make work and I say, this piece is, is, is inspired by the Yoruba conception of, 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 of life and death and the reincarnation of that, I'm honoring the Yoruba philosophy. When I say I'm making a work that is inspired by Walesha Inca's prison notes, I'm honoring Walesha Inca by doing that. So the fact of mentioning, of naming already, it's already um, giving power to the thing that is being named in whatever form, whether for good or for bad. You're naming it and it continues to exist. So I actually use invisibility or, 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 or negation as, as a weapon of forcing the thing to go into extinction and allowing the things that has always been extinction to come to life <laughs> by naming it into reality. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for that. That's so powerful. Uh, I, I love what you say about this necessity to, and Tuli touched on it as well, this, um, this idea, the, the imaginary and the imagine, uh, the, 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 yeah the dreamscape, <laughs> to quote your background, um, as the, the field or the terrain that we need to kind of exist in. Um, and it makes me think of Gloria Anzaldúa, who, who says, I think it's in Borderlands, um, that in order to create the world that we want to move into, we must first be able to see it in our minds. Um, and it also makes me think of how this idea of like intention or, or, or even like magic or alchemy, like the thing that you give your attention to is the thing that will manifest. And that magic or alchemy um, is just a process of intention. Um, and I find it very powerful what you propose about, as opposed to placing all of our energy and all of our intention towards whiteness and coloniality and critiques thereof, what happens when we start to put our energy into the dreamscape, into imagination, into the possibilities, um, asking these impossible questions about the possibility of a future outside of the current domination that we experience. 
Um, and on that note, I want to I want to shift back to to Tuli because in your thesis you speak a lot about Afrofuturism, while at the same time also speaking about Afro pessimism and these two sometimes considered ideas that are um, oppositional or binary, um, but both in the way that you articulate them in your thesis are ideas or spaces of potentiality and of considering um, options outside of the ones that we have or exist within today. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how Afrofuturism and Afropessimism appear and manifest in your practice as well as in your imagination. Um, good question. Um, yeah, so I mean, I suppose um, there's part of me that's on board with what Kudus is saying here, and part of me that's also um, invested in the idea that um, culture emerges from destroying things and from critiquing things, um, that there's a possibility that opens up from the, the focused violence against that which violates us and those we might be in solidarity with. Um, so for me, um, the Afro-pessimist view of the world, which, which frames it as an anti-Black world in which Black people are socially dead, subject to violence for no other reason other than being Black, um, and, and seen as, as not belonging, not having, not being familiarly bonded to people. Um, this is kind of the Afro-pessimist conception. And so the, the impetus is towards the end of the world, you know? Um, and so in my thesis, I was interested in Afrofuturism, not necessarily as Black people in space, which I also do love. Um, but theoretically, um, in the sense of, of the fact that in Afrofuturism, there's opportunities to think about time and history folding and unfolding in kind of different ways than, than how the West assumes history to take place in like a straight line towards progress. But in fact, we're kind of living in a world where there's things beneath and above and there's spiritual life and material life and life still to come, which are all kind of existing together in these circles, I would say. Um, and so Afrofuturism, I feel is one avenue to thinking about um, time outside of, of Western boring um, and, and useless lines. Um, so for me in, in my thesis, I was reading some of, of Sun Ra's writings um, and particularly Sun Ra's conception of um, the myth and black uh, he, he always spoke about himself as a myth. So, he, he has this kind of ongoing critique of the notion of, of humanity as conceptualized by whiteness. Um, and for me, I take, well, I was taking that thing up of the myth and comparing it with the Afro-pessimist, um, socially dead subject, um, which both of them are outside of, the human as proposed by whiteness and proposed by capitalism. Um, but both kind of direct their projects in different ways, but that I, that I think meet um, where the Afro-pessimist uh, is calling for the end of the world or destruction. Um, the myth is producing things that can't be produced by um, by the human world or by the white world. And so both of these are kind of um, embody or disembodiments um, that open up a different kind of way of being in the world. Um, 
because as much as, as, as white humanity is restricted from everyone else, there also has to, to come to be a time where you're like, I don't fucking want to be like that. Um, this is not my aim. Um, I'm not trying to replace myself into the position of power or recognition or legitimacy. So I feel that that the options of of being socially dead and the options of being a myth both operate in nice parallels. It's just about it's just about the kind of day you're having, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Am I feeling like an Afro pessimist? <laughs> what does the weather look like? <laughs> yeah. Or am I just like a myth? Yeah. Or am, I, or am I just a myth? Am I barely here? But yeah, I, I, I think that's so powerful to consider those kinds of like those parallels of those kinds of um, different options within the spectrum of like because both of these are proposing that whatever it is that we're conceived of now as black people and as people more broadly that conception or the way in which we move through the world and the world moves through us and experiences us is not human, is not, that is not personhood. Uh, and the, 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 the kind of theorization or the thinking of Afrofuturism and Afro-pessimism is like, okay, cool. If none of us are human because the systems that we've created have dehumanized all of us, what are the possibilities that we can investigate to articulate some kind of a, a becoming. And that can that becoming can be through social death and, and the, the ritual of, um, of passing on to, to move onto another kind of like plane of consciousness or another kind of um, existence. Um, or is it possible that it's, it's actually through the, 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 the mechanism of mythos and myth-making and ascendance into a world completely not of this one, which is actually the real world. And those propositions are really very ephemeral but exciting <laughs> and yeah. I, I, I mean I, I think they also they're both in order to make such a, a claim it's also a, a licensed poetry you know it's a bad reading of both um, mm -hmm. and I think it's it, it's a bad reading for the, for a purpose, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say this is like a smooth mathematic, mathematical theory. No, for sure not. And I think that's what makes it exciting because there is so much space for slippage and there's so many different articulations of what those possibilities are, as opposed to like you were speaking about before, the, the linearity that is proposed by the West, this linear progression, but also the linearity of logic. And I think that's that's really exciting that there is this kind of implicit within the kind of conversations around Afro pessimism and Afro futurism. There are can I, can I, say, can, I say, can I say something about that? Please, please jump in, Kudus. Yeah, um, I, 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 I think I follow I follow a bit of those two currents as well, and um, and and sometimes I get to be skeptical as well in the sense that to see a difference between those two things is to actually think in linearly. Uh, because when you think non-linear uh, and non-binary, you don't see, uh, it's a continuation actually. Life and death is a continuation. There is no end in, it, in itself. Uh, the piece we're working on now is titled reincarnation. So of course, we have thought a lot about uh, birth, death and rebirth as a concept, as as, as a philosophical base, like that is to say, let's ask ourselves the basic question. What if uh, the, 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 the philosophical base and the existential base for all of us wasn't um, life after death, but was actually reincarnation? That is to say, knowing that death is vital and death is a must, and there is also life, there is a rebirth that is after death. So when, when, I, when, we, when we chose the theme, this is the end, the future is black, for dance gathering. This was a year before COVID-19 that we chose this thing. And what we were saying was very clear that with the amount of acceleration and the amount of excess and an excessive way of existing as humans, humans which is nullifying all the other existing beings on earth that are non-human will is only heading towards one thing and that thing is doomed. But 
for us, the United States for us, for Africans, for black people who have experienced doom over and over and over again in different forms, colonialism, apartheid, slavery, we've experienced death many times. We've, we know something about reincarnation. And those, those of us who have experienced that, for me, I said to us, I say, if we know who we are for real, and we really invested in our own logic and in our own philosophy, we will realize that this so-called ending, whether it is through the Anthropocene or through COVID-19 or through uh, climate change, is an opportunity for a rebirth, for a remake, for a restart. Because whether we like it or not, apocalypse will never happen. It will, it will only happen one person at a time. And we've experienced it so many times. So for me, this ending, is there is no end, but whatever language we use for endings, it's always a violent event. But it's a violent event as a kind of a necessary sacrifice for what is to come after that. And and and, and that is where when we when we put those two those two phrases together, many people go like, "Wait, you said you just said this is the end, and you said the future is black." And and I said to them, I said, "Please don't mistake. When I say black, I'm not talking about race." And I mean it, I mean black, like black, black out, like nothing. <laughs> That's the future, <laughs> which, which, which in a way actually allows us to rethink everything, including blackness from the scratch all over again. Because I always say to people, I exist, I, I evolved from Nigeria. Nigeria is supposed to be the most populous black nations. But the irony of that is that it is the country where we are actually not black because blackness can only exist beside whiteness. Without whiteness, there is no blackness. There's just being, fullness in being, which is the original way of being before colonial, before blackness was invented 500 years ago. So for me, my, my own thing about the future is actually not the future of sci-fi, of human beings creating skyscrapers and whatever. It's actually, the, the future that if we look at time as a cycle, or even let's look at it as a triangle, if this is the future, this is the past, this is the present, all we, all, all, what the Western logic did was to make it linear and make it think it's going into a, an end. But there is no end because we will always come back to the cycle. So when, it's like when you look at the clock, we imagine the clock when it gets to 12, that's one. When it gets to another 12, that's two. That's the way the Yoruba counts time. Time is not about linearity of events. It's actually the event, the capacity and the, the, the intensity of the event is what counts time, not just chronologically speaking. So for me, when we look at time in a non-linear way, really, we see that there is actually no line. There is no thin line that says, this is where it ends, this is where it begins. It's actually one thing that keeps, that keeps oscillating. So either it's Afro-pessimism or Afrofuturism, really, if we're not thinking of it as European construction of futurism and pessimism, we will see that if we, that, that Afro that we put there is, is almost like a corruption of what a thing is. So I do not say too much on the thing itself. I go back and I say, instead of talking about Afrofuturism, let me, let me look at this thing from a Yoruba understanding of temporality. And when I start from temporality as a thing itself, then I realize that there are multiple ways, just like Copano uh, uh, said, there are multiple ways eventually of looking at these things without actually creating a, a, a conflict between them. Thank you so much for that intervention, which is so well-timed and so necessary. Uh, I really love that, um, that kind of Oribus um, mm, metaphor that you use of death as, as, as a continuation. And even in our language, because of the kind of ubiquity or the, the, the kind of um, everywhereness of colonial logic, Western logic, that there isn't a beginning and there isn't ending. And these two things are separate events that are not connected or that are, are linear. And to kind of bend that, uh, that temporality to, to serve the purposes of blackness or to serve the purposes of <laughs> non-blackness by virtue of Euro Yoruba cosmology where there is no black because black is the default. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a really exciting proposition. And I think it, it, it's 
that that particular part of your of your your, your intervention the ubiquity that we use terminology like people of color like black like white as if they have the same kind of um, utility everywhere in the world where like you say those things can only exist if supposed opposition is constructed so even the um the language that we use is infected by or infected or rather it is enmeshed within that complex uh, complexity and i also really appreciate what Tudi says about it is also helpful to have very particular language to speak to what it is that we're thinking that we're speaking about within this language that in and of itself has its limitations by virtue of its construction um, so I want to thank you for that and, and I also appreciate that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that in the comments, um, there is someone who may have a question, but the, comment, the question is not there. Marilu, if you have a question, feel free to put your question in the Q&A function so I can actually see it, because right now it's not coming up in the comment section. And that goes for everyone. We're looking at about 20 minutes before the close of this conversation. So if you do have questions, please do not be shy to put them in the Q&A. <laughs> Um, I want to say that, or I want to bring our conversation a bit back to um, this this um, this idea of the of these binaries. Um, and in your thesis, Tuli, you 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 quote quite a lot the work of uh, Oyeranke Oyewumi, a Nigerian feminist scholar, and her um, text, The Invention of Woman, where she quite explicitly um, puts in her thesis that the construction of binarism based on biological determination. Uh, determinism and presentation and visuality is an inheritance from the West. So this um, bio, bio, uh, biologization of gender uh, by virtue of presentation, so man, woman, black, white, etc., is an inheritance. And by virtue of that inheritance also implicates or um, enmeshes itself within our discourse. So her thesis is that even within feminism, the way that it gets articulated on um, the African continent, and this extends past feminism, feminism, capitalism, um, leftism, all the isms, their articulations are through that binarized lens, that visualized lens that we inherit from the West. Um, and so the questions that we ask ourselves, even on the left, through, the, through feminism, through leftist movements, um, are questions that perhaps are not the right questions for our context, but are inherited questions. So the, the, the problem of uh, male and female on the continent, there's already an inherent assumption that those categories exist in the same way as they do in the Western world, and there's a conflict there. And I wonder, Tudi, if you can speak to that binarization or that binarism and how it is that you imagine or the possibilities for complicating that binarism that you found in your work. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot again um, recently. Um, I suppose in terms of Oyewumi's text, which just breaks down one example of why uh, Western thinking cannot account for um, all histories, um, so that, that's always been a very useful text for me, even though I know it has been critiqued back and forth a lot, um, since whenever it came out, like I think in the late nineties. Um, but this thing of, of trying to not even escape the binary or just not use it. Is, is something that I've been struggling with and thinking about, um, especially, I suppose, in, in the conflictual, like, racial understandings of South Africa, um, where we have Black consciousness, um, which is a far more opaque political identification of all people of color, um, who stand politically against white supremacy versus um, labels of people within the kind of uh, taking up apartheid segregatory language that divides people. So we have 
the fact that white people in both of these um, examples remain white and are able to sustain their own kind of political opacity and mystique, whereas black people are made to scramble to kind of um, label one another um, and identify one another in these really crude ways that even begin to break down skin tone. Um, where, of course, with black consciousness, there has to be an awareness of the different oppression that people experience. But what it denies to whiteness is, um, is this kind of naked declaration of self according to um, whiteness as a kind of neutral standard. And so for me, that the, the energy of black consciousness is something that I'm trying to take up um, in everything in the sense that, that black consciousness is talking about blackness as an identity that is queered from whiteness. It's the non-normative, but it refuses to declare absolutely anything else about itself. Um, and it refuses to reproduce the, the tribalism that colonialism introduced into South Africa um, and the continent wide and everywhere else. Um, so I guess, yeah, for me um, and in my work, I want to kind of try to assume that position of of queerness, but at the same time refuse to identify myself um, and refuse to be, um, refuse to operate according to whiteness as a neutral standard. Um, so I guess like in my, in my work, I mean, I try to, I try to use language that doesn't run into the POC, uh, by POC, this, that. Um, I know terms that are useful to some extent in organizing, but I feel like um, continue to replicate the fact that um, only people who are not white um, have difference and all of those differences are able to be categorized. And so as we go on, we'll make our language larger and larger and larger so that finally we can account for someone's entire personhood through a series of naming. But white people just remain white people. So for me, like claiming that kind of political opacity is crucial because I think that only within that opacity amongst ourselves we can recognize the different shit that's been going on for all of us. Um, so even something like intersectionality, it also it also is 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 binary because it it kind of um, grows from and presents itself in relation to the American legal system, which is where it originally comes from, and so intersectionality definition is a way to make one's self and one's body visible to the American law, which doesn't recognize black people and black women and black queers anyway. So we need to be careful, like we take on intersectionality as a strategy to negotiate with the law, for instance. But amongst ourselves, we don't have to like taxonify. What's this word? We don't have to like taxonify. Catalog ourselves, you know, like in a colonial museum's catalog. Um, we don't need to reproduce this language amongst ourselves because it's. I feel it's so violent. Um, there's, for me, there's only like one declaration and it's that blackness is queered and queerness 
is is blackness. These things operate in in a kind of circle. Um, and declaring anything else for me beyond a politics feels violent. So I guess that's what I try to hold space for in the work that I make. Mm. Yeah. And I think that that kind of slippage and that that circularity is a lot of what Kudus is talking about with like, why, why do we continue to operate in these binaries and why do we continue to answer back? Um, if like you say, the entity at which we are hurling these answers is allowed to remain both static and completely inobservable and uh, unnamed. Um, and I think that's really important and kind of right on. Um, we have 10 minutes to go and we have two questions uh, from folks in the audience. Um, so I'm going to start with the question from Marilu. Um, Marilu's question, hi all, thank you for this powerful moment, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. My question, I see how we Black Africans navigate perfectly against colonialism and yeah, maybe against patriarchy too, but what about capitalism? How are you dreaming a post-capitalist reality? I feel like Black American communities dreaming inside are dreaming inside of capitalism and that is colonial. So dot, 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 hugs from Mars. Um, so I guess I want to direct that question. <laughs> the hugs are very important. I want to I want to direct that question um, maybe to Kudus. How how do you imagine? First of all, do you imagine that post post um, a post capitalist society is inherently a post colonial post black um, society? Um, and how do you imagine that in your practice you are gesturing towards a post capitalist possibility or reality? Um, I, 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 I um, presently um, um, a, a, what I call a maker in residence um, at the University of Florida under a project that just started titled uh, the Center for Arts, Migration and Entrepreneurship. And um, I, take, I take the entrepreneurship aspect of it quite um, important because I know that um, there is a little we can do about um, liberation, if we don't think about our political structures and we don't think about our economy. Uh, I, I, somebody said in the 60s that uh, the British, if they could figure out a way to continue to rule the economy from Britain, I think they would prefer that option than coming here into the malaria and dying of mosquitoes. So, so he who controls the economy really controls everything. So I think one of the things that we must think about is that, um, Capital in itself, I don't think is what is the the the, um, the problem. It is the it is the corruption of capital as the most important in the um, regardless of whatever the the kind of the vulgar way at which uh, white Americans invented it, using slavery as the start of it as the first capital were slaves. So for me, I think um, there are other forms of collaboration. I always say to people, I say, I actually think that if slavery was not, um, was not turned into this, this, this evil thing, I think it was supposed to be the first form of collaboration that happened on a global scale. That is to say, we take human resources from the African continent, we go get natural resources from the American continent and we transform it into finished products on the European continent. Only that the only thing that happened was that the continuation didn't continue. They didn't continue the sense of collaboration and sharing that happened amongst the whole of humanity or at least this, this triangular humanity. Only that one aspect of that humanity decided to keep all the gains from that collaboration in one place. If we look at colonialism, slavery from that idea of collaborating in, in making something together, not looking at the, of course, the, the humanization, the, 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 the ways at which it was eventually operated. But in terms of collaboration, just like we people were talking about the, um, the return, the returning of the artworks to the African continent. And I said to them, if you ask me, I would say, you know what? Keep it there. <laughs> All I want is that every 
tourists that come into your museum, let's start sharing whatever they bring into three. <laughs> that is to say, you keep one and you send one to the owners of the thing, and then we use one to develop more stuffs. So for me, if we actually share, I think what the real thing about capitalism is the inability to learn how to share equally on an equal, equal footing based on what we all work together to make. And for me, if we start to think about it from that point of view, then we see that there's a whole bunch of collaboration that is required among black people, whether from the African continent, from Europe or from America or from anywhere else where black people are, when we begin to think intercommunally, that is to say, I bring what I make, what is possible from Lagos. I come to South Africa, we exchange, we share both our capacity to produce and our capacity to sell. And if that is what we meant by, by, by capital, Afro-capitalism, that is to say a new form of collaboration, thinking more about the project that we want to achieve together, and then using that as a sense of cooperative, that is to say, it's your turn now, it's your turn now. I believe that there's a whole bunch of people who are experimenting in a whole new form of, of how do we keep the economy alive without falling again into the trap of capitalism as it is. Thank you for that, Kudus. That's a really complex proposition <laughs> that you that you put forward. Um, and I, I think I, I think I grasp the main points. And I think like if we look at history and we look at like different modes of um, anti-establishment collaboration, even in the kind of anarchist tradition, this collaboration um, and um, building coalitions across difference is essential to um, all of our survival. And, and so at the root of what you say, I feel like this is, this is what I hear, the necessity to find modes of collaboration and modes of um, building coalitions uh, across those divides to share resources. Um, whether that is through the current framework that we have, I, I think we can all agree that that is not possible. Um, and one of the, the, the barriers to that is the underlying belief system that capitalism upholds, um, which is based on white supremacy or the idea of the, the white race as superior. And I wonder from you, Tuli, if you, to answer the same question, through the work that you're doing, do you, how do you imagine, or what does a, a post-capitalism or post-capitalist society or reality look like, or how does that relate to your practice? Um, sure. So, yeah, I mean, as you're saying, and, and I agree, I think, um, I feel some of what Kudus is saying, but for sure, I don't believe it, that um, there's anything with the word capitalism in it that um, has any kind of possibility for collective Black liberation, um, because, you know, like, I guess as like Robinson or whoever like conceptualizes capitalism, it's a system that's based on profit on the one side and exploitation on the other side. And in order to exploit in this way, you have to be able to hold and live with the view that you believe some people are objects for exploitation and some people are humans for profit or to enjoy profit. Um, there's no way to conceptualize capitalism without this understanding of of some people not being human, um, which is to say then exchange and sharing and trade um, on the continent would not be capitalism, would be some, some other thing. Um, so in my own work, I mean, I guess recently what I've been doing, um, I taught a really small and nice class of postgraduates. Um, it was called Writing Arts Histories. And one of the things we were doing, or the main thing we were doing really is, is reading South African art history and, and responding 
to it. Um, in, in many ways, trying to destroy some popular concepts that have emerged in recent art history. Um, and for me, it's in these very small kind of and intense and intimate dealings with history, with what exists and, and coming to make sense of how it came to exist and, and writing back to that but in, in the details, you know, in every area. And, and I, don't, I don't know how to imagine uh, a post-capitalist society in a kind of general way, in the same way that in panel discussions of like, Tuli, how do you think we decolonize art practice? Like no one, no one can kind of concept um, such a broad and, and global idea because these ideas are not broad and they're not global. They're about kind of the intimacy of daily life and of daily interactions. So for me, like maybe also to kind of borrow from anarchist notions of like um, prefigurative politics or or living in the way that you think the world should be, you know, whether it's in kind of the white world of like commune living or, or like making these outside spaces. I mean, that's not what I'm trying to do, but maybe it's what I'm trying to do. Um, but I'm I'm interested in in producing in producing the work that doesn't negotiate in terms of exploitation and profit. So doing that shit every day, even though it means that we're buying in, or even at the same time that it means we might be buying into capitalism to pay rent to do this and this and this, um, instead of imagining some future world, it, it seems to me that it has to feel like in my work, somehow I'm, I'm in a space where these are not the, the logics through which I'm negotiating and deciding how to work. Um, so I mean, again, to, to come back to like radical queerness or um, black consciousness, I feel like these are both options that don't adhere to this kind of, um, dialectical, like just this bounce between two options where either you profit or you are exploited. Um, so I don't know, it's not, it can never be about the future, you know, as Kudus was saying, <laughs> it, it never ends or nothing ever ends. Um, so there has to be some sort of ways that we're able to see what the moments are and what the work is that we are already doing that's operating in its own logic. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think that um, that idea of like the insurgency that we have to kind of perform within capitalism or under capitalism speaks a lot to, I think, or some of what, what Kudus was saying in the sense that we find ourselves under capitalism, we find ourselves in the situation and what are the possibilities for um, resource sharing and, and, and dissemination if the dominant society, dominant party, dominant whatever is not going to facilitate that, how do we perform that function um, and how do we imagine it in different ways? And I really love what you say about thinking on almost like an atomic level, like thinking in small collectivities what does that look like? How does that operate? How does this resource dissemination operate outside of the dependence on governments that are invariably failing and capitalist systems that were in, have in their design the domination um, of um, certain subjects uh, all over the world? Um, we are actually over time, but I want to take the one last question, final question for the evening. Um, and then the other question that we have, um, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to it, the question in the, in the chat section, but I want to get to a question in the Q&A from Joachim. 
Um, the question is, thank you for the spirited, engaging conversation. I'm really inspired by the way you conceive time outside progressive notions, but how about its connection with space? Are there different conceptions of space connected to your idea of time? And how are these related to your views on art education or transformation? So I'm gonna ask Kudus to go ahead and take it away. Um, so um, my last work uh, was titled Spirit Child. <clears throat> and um, the one I'm making now is that the reincarnation. So if reincarnation is about time, Spiritual was really about space. Um, that is to say, the way the Yoruba conceptualize space is just like time. It's um, it's on three folds. That is the space of the living, that of the unborn, and that of the ancestors. And uh, the, the 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 connection between these three spaces is actually time. That is to say, the three of them exist within the same time. And the best way to explain that is if you were in Chicago right now. Um, you are six hours behind Lagos, but we actually have the capacity to communicate at the same time. Uh, with your six hours different, with my six hours e earlier, does it mean that I'm in your future? Or does it mean that you are in my past? No, it just means that we are operating on a different space. And, and that is for me is also where the whole conception of, of looking at, um, space and time from a from a western construct is 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 very very minimal in the ways that which some other cultures have, have conceptualized space and, space and time for for thousands of years before now and and that for me is everything i think about when i say what if we imagine reincarnation as the base reincarnation really speaks about those two things that is to say you actually make the cycle between the space of the living that of the dead, which is that of the ancestors, then coming back through the space of the unborn. It only exists in different layers and the portals at which we exist, at which we uh, get access to those ports, to those doors is, is what differs. And um, if we if we look at the Babalao, which will be like what we call the Sangomas uh, in, in, Yoruba, in Yoruba cosmogony, the Babalao, they are like, they are like diviners, of course, uh, which gives, um, which kind of like gets, um, privilege access to those different layers of existence, and through that they can they can make divination and they can make suggestions and they can they can even alter uh, already made transactions and stops it and say no you are you are a you are a um, internet fraud star trying to steal from this person's spiritual world. I stop that that transaction. So for me, I see that as a way. At which, if we think of that really as, as the base, even the way we teach becomes really very, very um, different. Because the fact that I am 20 and you are 50 doesn't necessarily mean that you're older than me based on the cycles of time we've come here and how many times I've been here. So, so the kid has to be honored based on what he or she has come here to do or to fulfill based on the previous lives. So for me, the whole question of age, of gender, also because that is also kind of fluid, that also changes. The fact that you are a black man this time around, you might come back to Chinese woman, who knows? The fact that you are here in Lagos this time around, you might, you might, you might have been a Chinese. You know, I remember a, a, a Sangoma woman saw me, saw my show in, 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 in Amsterdam some eight years ago. And uh, after the show, she came to hug me and she was like, thank you, Kudus. Um, you will be all right. I said, thank you. And, he said, and she said, um, there is an Indian, you have an Indian blood. There is a chief that is always around you. And I'm like, but because of where I'm coming from, I, I, didn't, I didn't dispute it. Even though my conscious mind tells me, nah, there's no Indian blood anywhere here. <laughs> but because of what she is and what I know, what I believe in, I accepted it. I was able to, to receive that message. Thank you so much, Kudus. Uh, for you, Tuli, how do you imagine that space time intersect in this way? Got it. <laughs> so, still haven't learned that four months in. Um, 
I guess uh, for me, um, I'm interested in how time and space are constructed and created to, to pretend to have some sort of order. Um, the 24 hour clock, um, of course it responds to day and night in some way, but it also is, is created in the logic of a working day. Um, the classroom is organized in a particular way most times where the desks are arranged facing the teacher who stands up at the front and the children are all sitting down. Um, when you wait for something, you wait in lines, you face the person in front of you's back. Um, when you have a meeting, you address something through a facilitator or a chair, um, as opposed to another kind of conversation where you talk directly to one another. And these are all kinds of rules that we make about how space and time should normatively work. But they're, of course, arbitrary in the sense that this is one option that now we've all bought into. Um, like, it could have just landed up that all, if, if the West had the tradition of, of classrooms that were always built in circles with, like, windows in the roof um, and you learned lying down in a circle, you know, we'd all be doing that shit. It's arbitrary in the same kind of way. Um, so in that sense, I guess I'm interested in my work through writing, through art making, curating, and in education spaces of, of using space and time in the wrong kinds of ways, um, of, of making mistakes about how things should be used and, um, and reading the space, reading the room wrong, I guess. Um, because we're stuck, we're like so stuck in, in one option and one unfolding of time and space. And I think maybe just to, to come back to one thing that happened in Cape Town, that one Rhodes um, bust that got smashed um, a statue of Cecil John Rhodes, whose head was like decapitated in the past couple of days. Um, that's the wrong way to use space. That's the wrong way to treat the space of a statue. Um, there's a way that you must stand and look and be subject to the statue's gaze. And when you decapitate Rhodes, you refuse to operate um, using the rules of institutional space. So for me, space is, is something that is always curated, always organized. And because of the, the kinds of conditions we're living in is organized in order to reproduce the same kind of power, um, which oppresses and, um, and humanizes on the other hand. So for me, that's what, what space is, a, a series of constructs that we need to, to make a concerted effort to, to destroy because in that destruction, we're just doing another option and seeing how that goes. So yeah, that's what space is for me. Mm. Dope, yeah, yeah. I really like this, the connection that you make between engaging with or with destruction um, and this idea of the wrong kind of use of space and finding these kinds of wrong ways of using space to to do almost a certain kind of time travel because to decapitate the statue of Cecil John Rhodes is to return to everything that his legacy means on the continent um, and to address it in the contemporary moment and in this moment where all over the world was seeing the removal of all of these colonial era statues, um, that is an access point or a response to space that is also allowing us to time travel and to answer questions that have been um, asked or have been taken to be our mandate um, in the contemporary age, but that come from supposedly different age, um, thinking about time linearly, but then also 
bending it and this this kind of meeting point of the the, the, the destruction of these statues is that meeting point so i think that's that's really dope and i really appreciate that um that uh that that, that offering um, so we are definitely 15 minutes over time. I'm so thankful to everyone who stayed with us this long. So, so thankful to our fantastic, fantastic panelists, Tulila Kametze, Kudis Omikeku. Um, I wonder, I wanted to give you guys just one last word if there's anything that you want to share in terms of where people can find more of your work, whether it's Instagram, website, et cetera. If you have any projects upcoming, if you can just quickly flash fire, um, let us know what you're working on, if there's any way where we can follow it and where we can find out more about your work. Kudus, go ahead. Um, yeah, we're making works and <laughs> and um, some of the collaborations that existed during Dance Gathering this, this year, uh, because we did it remotely for the first time. Um, most of the works that came out of that are now being published on a particular website we developed uh, called acropolis.org. Acropolis, like A-F-R-O-P-O-L-I-S dot org. Uh, there you can find a whole bunch of um, uh, videos and performance videos uh, from Dance Gathering this year, and of course, uh, some other kind of materials there. Um, aside that, you can follow me through my personal website, kudusunikeku.com, or through our projects in Lagos, kudansenter.com, or uh, the um, spiritualproject.com thespiritualproject.com, which is where I expand more on this conception of space and time. Dope. Many thanks, Kudus. And yourself, Tulile, where can, are there any projects that you're working on at the moment that you'd like people to know about? And where can people find out more about you and your work and maybe follow you if that's something that you're into? Um, I've become a bit of an online a recluse. But I have an Instagram account called Aha uh -huh, How Come? Because um, I'm always questioning everything. <laughs> um, but otherwise, you can email me. I'll put my email address. Um, I'm, I had a website, but I'm kind of re reworking that. But yeah, if you'd like to contact me, please feel free on Instagram or over email. Um, and yeah, we'll see what happens if I get some funding. That's always the then question. I, then it might just be the end of the world. <laughs> 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 Jokes, but yeah, trying to organize a publication. Sweet. Well, fingers crossed for the organization of the publication. Fingers crossed for you, Kudus, as well, for the projects that you're working on. Thank you so much for taking the time to offer your expertise and your insights to us. Thank you so much to our attendees. And please don't be shy to join us for our next session of In the Soup, which will be taking place on the 29th of July at 7.30, once again, online, where we'll be talking about Black emergency. Um, thank you to everyone who's been joining us so far. Thank you for the fantastic questions. I just want to give a big thanks to Sharice. Um, who offered a question in the chat section that we weren't able to get to. Thank you so much for your engagement. Um, and until next time, I'll see you in the soup. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. -bye. Thank you, Bye, Thank you to Lule. Bye. So nice meeting you. Ciao.